Good evening. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. First thing on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Could I get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. And we do have Olga as an excused absence tonight, so we'll do a roll call vote, please. Megan Dugan? Aye. Marianne Duncan Cole? Aye. Penny Love Hensley? Aye. Vikram Katwani? Aye. Marie Coffey? Aye. And Christy Morgan? Aye. The motion passes. Next up um, is public comments. So there's uh, one thing I wanted to clarify. It seems there was some confusion around advanced comment registration. That can only be done for virtual comments and the details are on the website. So if you're gonna make comment virtually, you can find the details there. Otherwise, if you're gonna comment in person, we ask that you do that here before the meeting. Um, the guidelines, as always, please don't play video or audio for us. We wanna hear your comments. Please no applause between speakers. Please keep your comments directed at the board and not at each other. Please be respectful during comments. And this is your time for us to hear your comments. We won't be answering questions or going back and forth with you. We'll keep a timer on the screen for two minutes and we're gonna change it this time. I heard that it's sort of a long time for people to stand um, when we have five people in line. So Mary will call one and then we'll have one waiting. Um, and as, when you get to the microphone, please say your name, okay? All right, we'll be beginning with our three virtual public comments, starting with Katherine Gardner. Good evening. My name is Katherine Gardner, pronoun she, her, and I am a resident of Vancouver. I commend the Fort Vancouver Regional Library for providing a stellar variety of computer and Wi-Fi options at their branches. It can allow library patrons to research fascinating subjects, such as a Swedish cohort study quoted in recent board meetings. It is a study with findings which the lead researcher, Dr. Cecilia Hione, has publicly discussed as being misinterpreted and misused by anti-trans groups. Per Dr. Hione, quote, the findings have been used to argue that gender affirming treatment should be stopped since it could be dangerous. However, the results have also been used to show the vulnerability of transgender people and that better transgender health care is needed. The conclusion of the cohort study itself states that, quote, the findings suggest that sex reassignment, although alleviating gender dysphoria, may not suffice as treatment for transsexualism and should inspire improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment for this patient group, end quote. Dr. Hione has further stated outside the study that, quote, the aim of trans medical interventions is to bring a trans person's body more in line with their gender identity. However, trans people as a group also experience significant social oppression in the form of bullying, abuse, rape, and hate crimes. Medical transition alone won't resolve the effects of crushing social oppression. She continues, what we found is that treatment models which ignore the effects of cultural oppression and outright hate aren't enough. We need to understand that our treatment models must be responsive to not only gender dysphoria, but the effects of anti-trans hate as well. That's what improved care means, end quote. I encourage all people interested in learning more to take advantage of the library's awesome technology features to better evaluate and understand information such as that contained within the Swedish cohort study. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Our next speaker will also be a virtual commenter, GoGo. Hello, my name is Gogo. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a local caregiver in Vancouver. Um, everyone that is there protesting drag story time is aligning themselves with white supremacy, Christo fascism, trans misogyny, and violence. Real violence that occurs daily, not the potential possibilities of queer influences. Everyone you see in support of drag story time did not come in as a club. We are separate members of this community that are forced to debate our own existence. These people have no reference for the difference between drag performers and trans people, so this is not just about drag story time. If your kid's entire identity is swayed by an hour of reading books with someone wearing a bunch of makeup, they're probably queer. 
a few meetings ago, someone had the nerve to say, we're not saying we're against this. We're saying, why don't you just go to Donnell's? The library is not the place. Not only did that silly man suggest a dive bar is a more appropriate place to read books to kids than the library, but we just had armed bigots target the very thing suggested. Heathen Brewing had their windows smashed because of hosting a drag brunch that was going to be all ages. These people's allies have been sending death threats to brewery employees daily, going as far as sending pictures of employees' children to them as a threat of we know where you live. Make no mistake, the people whining protect the children are the ones engaging in literal violence against not just queer people and their allies, but everyone's kids. You, board, have been bullied by the same extremists to the point of canceling drag story time. We cannot fight fascism with love. If you could, queer people would run the world because we are inherently the most divine example of it. We love each other, we love ourselves, even in the face of death, legislation, and physical violence. How you do fight fascism is with power, and you board have a little bit of power. The library is a public space, meaning everyone is welcome. Bring back drag story time. There is more support than you know for this decision. And if we were unhoused, you would open your doors. Where else are we to go? Our next speaker will be Katie Emmerich. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Katie Emmerich of Vancouver, pronouns she, they. Uh, in 2019, I was an employee of FBRL. Uh, I took personal time so that I could take my children to what would end up being the final drag queen story hour. My partner and I had to pull our children through a crowd of protesters, some of whom sit in this room today, in order to take them to a library program. In the end, my partner and I took our children out because the so-called protesters who held signs expressing their desire to, quote, make the library safe for children, unquote, were in fact photographing and videotaping children and doxing them online. In our family, we make every effort to ensure our children's online presence is entirely their own choice. In violating children's privacy and doxing them, the library's strong protesters also broke one of the explicitly stated rules of conduct by filming patrons inside the library. Yet the only action taken by the library administration was to pause Drag Queen story hours indefinitely rather than protect the children and the queer and trans library staff from an outside hate group. There wasn't even an incident report filed. This, in my opinion, has led to the emboldening of our local hate group sitting here in their teal shirts, including their assumption that they are responsible for stopping Drag Queen story hours. Library administration has rolled over and caved to the pressure of this loud minority of bigots in our community and your queer and trans staff, as well as community members, including children, have suffered as a result. Please, I implore you, allow the library to fulfill its stated mission of providing a story for everyone, which must include our valuable queer and trans community members. And once and for all, declare your support for a library that is inclusive. Visibility saves lives and hate should never triumph over love. Our first two in-person public comments will come from Wendy and Justin. Oh, just one moment. There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Wendy and I'm a Clark County resident. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. As always, I would like to ask the board to continue to follow its equity policy despite the hateful rhetoric. Hate can take many forms, but is always destructive, tearing apart communities and creating divisions where there should be unity. We must not let hate go unchallenged. I would like to quote the words of Martin Nymoller. First, they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. These words are powerful reminder that we must stand up against fascist hate, even if it does not affect us directly. Fascists use propaganda to demonize certain groups of people, portraying them as a threat to the nation or a perceived dominant group. This can create a sense of fear and hatred toward these groups, leading to discrimination and violence. We must be willing to speak out, even if it means standing up to those who hold positions of power. 
When we remain silent in the face of hate, we are complicit in its perpetuation. It eventually comes for us too. This is not hyperbole. Therefore, we must speak out against hate in all of its forms and stand in solidarity with those who are targeted. We see examples of hate in our communities every day. From some of the groups of people in here tonight to hateful language on social media, it can be easy to feel overwhelmed and powerless in the face of such hate, but we must remember that we're not alone. We can come together as a community and stand up to hate and work towards a more equitable future for all. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Justin and next in line will be Zachmo. Hi, my name is Justin. And for the first time I've read the Drag Queen Story Hour FAQ and I've noticed in the three months since I've been coming here that not a single one of these five books has been talked about whatsoever at these library board meetings as being objectionable. I also noticed that since coming to this first in January, I haven't actually heard a single thing about anything that happened on library property one way or the other in 2019. And I'd been searching, trying to find anything even a little bit objectionable from what the board had did or what it had allowed for. And I see a picture of this person, you know, in a long dress wearing more clothing than I think any single person in this room is right now. And I get confused. I get really confused why this is a problem. Drag as a storytelling tool has been part of our culture for at least 500 years. I watched plenty of things involving drag as a kid growing up from, you know, Bugs Bunny to the Mrs. Doubtfire with no issues. But all of a sudden, it's... I suppose the moment to hate the LGBT again. 15 years ago, it was the gay lifestyle that we we're all being inducted into. 15 years before that, there was the tail end of Hispanic panic. And today we've got grooming or the sexualizing of kids. And yet all you're gonna hear tonight from the various people that a Republican PCO put teal shirts on for some reason is bad stuff, vague ephemeral things, but none of it's gonna be about the library, not a single thing. Any person, thank you, not a single thing anyone's gonna say tonight happened on library property. Not a single thing was done bad by library staff. I mean, it says right here, there was a librarian guiding these events the whole time. So any vague accusations of impropriety is a direct, uh, a direct accusation upon you and your staffs. Uh, the library should everybody, bring this thing back. Our next commenter will be Zachmo, followed by Gary Wilson. Hey, hey, uh, Bugs Bunny may not have influenced that guy, uh, but clearly uh, I took it and ran with it. So I'm Zachmo the Incredible. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, they, them. Um, it's my library card. I do this a whole bunch and uh, I don't see enough. I don't see enough. I'd like to see more. Um, as a child, my local library was a place where I spent the majority of my time. Uh, it kept me safe from a violent neighborhood, an abusive father, and as a bonus, had both electricity and running water. That's something I didn't have the majority of the time growing up. We read books like Choose Your Own Adventure and The Hardy Boys, but I also found Tom Robbins and Gunter Grass and Fyodor Dostoevsky and Burroughs. We talked about Burroughs, Dan. Ginsburg, uh, Orwell, Vonnegut, Ingalls. Uh, tons, tons of books, uh, many of which uh, ended up being banned. Um, these books led uh, me to have a profound love of literature. Uh, my trans sister is library director of Houston Public Library, and my brother is the library director of Durango Public Library. Uh, you can look them up. They're fucking awesome people. These books shaped us. Uh, these books, uh, Farewell to Arms, Animal Farm, and Frank's Diary of a Young Girl, uh, these books have been banned. Uh, but the message still rings true in, in most of them, and that's to fight sexism, fight racism, fight oppression, and to fight for equality for ourselves and our community, because we protect us. If you've read any of these books and you're sitting here advocating for the removal of books for libraries, come get it. Come take this. You need it more than anyone else in this room. Thank you, Board of Trustees. Please a reminder, no cursing. Thank you. Our, our next speaker will be Gary Wilson, followed by Mike Johnson. On February 23rd, 2019, less than a month after I started standing up for children in our library, I was talking to my dad 
and he asked what I thought about Robert Kraft, the Patriots owner and well-known philanthropist in my hometown or state of Massachusetts after being arrested that week in a massage parlor. I said, Dad, let's say 50% of the men in this country have paid for sex. I don't know the percent. God does. They can't throw a stone. And I said, and let's say another 25% of the men in this country have taken advantage of a woman in some way. I don't know the percent. God does. They can't throw a stone. And since you asked me what I think, I've never paid for sex. I've never taken advantage of a woman in any way. And if you ask all my former girlfriends, that's exactly what they'll tell you. So I can throw a stone, but I lay my stone down. I then went into the Old Testament explaining how when man sinned, he had to do a blood sacrifice to be forgiven. But if he sinned the next day, he'd have to do another sacrifice. The blood sacrifice only covered his past sin, not future, but it pointed to the coming ultimate sacrifice that Christ would give. And that when you believe and trust in his sacrifice, all your sins, past, present, and future would be forgiven. And I asked my dad, would you like to receive Christ as your personal savior? And he said, yes. Afterwards, he said, it feels like a great weight's been lifted off my chest. And I said, yes, that's confirmation. Your name's just been written in the book of life. It can't be erased. It can't be whited out. And he giggled, ha ha, white out. And I said, Dad, if I die first, the day you day, die, I'll see you in heaven. And if you die first, the day I die, I'll see you in heaven. And I said, Dad, this is one of my best days ever. Ten minutes later, my mom received Christ. And I said, this is my best day ever. And it was. After praying for 39 years, God gave me the greatest gift I could ask. And that was God confirming his calling in my life to stand up for children. So I want you to know I will never step away from this cause because of how he's blessed it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Johnson, followed by Jane Higgins. Good evening, board members. Thank you for allowing us uh, testimony tonight. My name is Mike Johnson. I live in Moshugal. The third drag queen story hour held at the Vancouver Community Library where the drag queen performer, Onalicious Mercury, asked an eight-year-old boy what he wanted to be when he grew up and the child answered, Spider-Man. And Onalicious said, or Princess Spider-Man, teaching the boy to question his gender. When is it ever in the best interest of a child to, to question their gender? No one will attempt to answer that question because they can't defend it. Recent studies have shown that children and, and adults who severely question their, their gender are 40 times more likely, not 40% more likely, but 40 times more likely to commit suicide or have suicidal thoughts than those who do not question their gender. Why would you want to lead an innocent three to eight year old child down this path, which is exactly what a drag queen story hour does. Also note that affirming the gender confused does not reduce the higher rate of suicide or suicidal thoughts as a person has previously mentioned at one of these meetings. Scientific case in point, Sweden, a gender affirming country for 50 years since the 1960s, had in the cohort study, which is the longest and, and most comprehensive study done to date, and was conducted over 30 years, concluding in 2011, which showed Sweden had the same higher rate of suicide or suicidal thoughts of the gender, gender confused as that of those in the US at the same time. This proved that, that affirming gender, con, con, the in gender confused does not lower their, their high rate of suicide. It's the ideology. Affirming the gender confused is not the answer and teaching healthy innocent children ages three to eight to question their gender is not in the best interests ever. Please do not have another drag queen story hour. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jane Higgins, and next to line up is Dan Deringer. I'm Jane Higgins from Battleground. There are two ways to tell a lie. One is not to tell the truth. The other is not to tell all of the truth. I have three examples. The oft-quoted and just-quoted study in these meetings reports that suicide attempts among gender confused youth have increased by 40% or 40 fold. This is true. The rest of the truth is that suicide among all teens and young adults, gender confused LGBTQ plus or straight has increased by 40% or more. Clearly more is influencing our young adults than drag queen story hours in libraries. The whole truth begs for our attention. A second example is Rick Smithroot, executive director of the Library Foundation, saying he has lost donors 
because the Vancouver Library hosted DQSH four years ago. The rest of the story is that the Library Foundation also received donations because the library did host DQSH. Please tell the whole story. Finally, Mr. Wilson claims that I lied when I was on the library board by saying the board does not write policy. What I said was that the board does not and will not write policy directing what programming the branch managers can offer. Directives to branch managers are beyond the legal parameters of the board of trustees. So please be sure you are told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Anything less is a manipulative lie. Our next speaker will be Dan Derringer and followed by Phil Cronenbush. So I, <clears throat> last time I was here, I read the, the handout that said that the last time we had a drag queen story was 2019. And, and so you just kind of wonder why people still are coming to address the board if you, if you didn't have it since. And I think that with the, with the reports and news reports around the country of what libraries are doing with materials and, and presenting them to, especially to kids, we're just all concerned that, uh, that you're not using the discretion that, that you have to, in, in, as a library, to present a, a safe environment for, for children is what it's, what it's about. And I know back in 2006, I talked about this last time when, when the SCOTUS ruled on the SEPA Act, that, that they made clear that libraries are not public forums. They said that libraries have a long tradition, long tradition of having a wide uh, discretion in what materials they offer. And if they, if they said that it's a tradition, then you can assume that for the last two, 300 years in this country, that libraries have made those choices on what they're gonna provide. The drag stream, drag queen story hours, the problem with that is the gender dysphoria issue. And as the speaker just recently said, in four, 40 times greater uh, uh, suicide rate. So, but, uh, but what the library does even beyond the drag stream horror story hours with promoting material to kids that promote behaviors that could be uh, detrimental to them. We're all concerned about it. We don't trust you. And that's why we're here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Phil Cronenbush, followed by Jude. <clears throat> Thank you, Phil Cronenbush, Vancouver. Thank you, library board members. We appreciate your service. It's interesting how the side that calls others haters are showing their true selves recently. A transgender killed six individuals, three of them children, simply for having a different belief system than theirs. That is true hate in action, not just a label thrown around. An angry mob punched, threatened, and shouted hateful rhetoric toward an NCAA female swimmer who was speaking about fair competition in female sports. Again, hate in action, not just a label thrown around. This is just in the past few weeks. Those screaming for tolerance are the least tolerant of all, but the tide is turning. Woke businesses pushing an aggressive agenda of finding out the hard way, just ask Bud Light, Maker, Anheuser-Busch, and Nike how their recent ads have affected their sales. The United Kingdom Gender Identity Development Services at the Tavistock Clinic was recently shut down after controversial use of puberty blockers. Other European countries like Sweden, Finland, and France are pulling back gender-affirming care for minors in light of fallout from the effects on minors in those countries in recent years. Sweden, Sweden Finland, and France were some of the first countries with gender affirming care, and it's very telling that now they are realizing the harm it can do to children. Please don't have another drag queen story hour, which can help lead a child down this dangerous path. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jude, followed by Quill Onstead. Hi, my name is Jude. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm here today to talk about drag queen, queen story hour. But first I wanted to show my library card and I wanted to show my first library card ever from when I was a kid. It even has a sticker from when I did the summer reading program. And I still have the number on the back memorized, even though I've gotten a new one and it's no longer that number, but the old number is still memorized because that's how important the library to me was growing up. I was someone who was constantly checking out books and it made a big difference to get books that 
you know, really resonated with me. Um, the mission of the library is to provide access to information and knowledge for all of the members of the community. And that includes people depending on their age, their race, their gender, sexuality, sexual identity, <laughs> gender identity, all the things, right? Um, we want it to be a place where it promotes diversity, tolerance, inclusion. And we know that Drag Queen Story Hour is a program where drag queens read books to children in libraries, in schools, in community places. It promotes literacy, creativity, imagination, and celebrates gender diversity and inclusion. I think that by hosting Drag Queen Story Hour, libraries can fulfill their mission by creating open, safe spaces where everyone is welcome, including members of the queer community. And it can help children learn about different types of people, culture, and experiences, and encourage them to embrace diversity and respect others. Additionally, libraries have a responsibility to serve the needs and interests of their local community. And it can be an effective way for libraries to engage with and respond to the needs of LBGTQ families and allies in their community. Overall, it fits with the mission of the library by promoting diversity, inclusion, and tolerance, and providing access to information and knowledge for all the members of the community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Quill Onstead, followed by uh, Jonna Meyer. Hi. My name is Quill Onstead and my pronouns are they, them. I'm here to speak in support of Drag Queen Story Hour as a genderqueer member of the community. When your car breaks down, you take it to a mechanic. You trust that the mechanic has the education and skills necessary to fix your car. If your house catches fire, you trust the firefighters, again, because they have the education and skills necessary to put out the fire. I am not a librarian. That requires a professional graduate level degree. Some people are no longer willing to trust that librarians have the education and skills necessary to do their jobs. They think librarians are now politically biased. Opponents of Drag Queen Story Hour claim that FBRL libraries advocated a political agenda when they presented Drag Queen Story Hour. Contrary to their opinion, the existence of LGBTQ plus people is not a political agenda. Telling children that it's okay for people to think, act, and deliver believe different things is not a political agenda. The American Library Association's stance on censorship can be found in the first edition in, of the Library Bill of Rights written in 1939. The ALA recognizes that questions do arise concerning the application of the Bill of Rights to specific library practices and has published the current interpretations as a matter of official ALA policy. I thought the board might find the interpretation on access to library services and resources for minors and the interpretation on labeling systems of particular interest. For the record, the ALA also has interpretations on the importance of diversity in collections, equity work, and the use of rating systems. Drag Queen Story Hour is a vital program that teaches kids about gender identity in an age appropriate manner. Parents who do not approve of Drag Queen Story Hour do not have to bring their children to Drag Queen Story Hour programs. Please trust the staff of FBRL libraries to adhere to the professional standards set by the ALA. Thank you for your service to the community. Our next speaker is Jonna Meyer and next in line, Bob Liggett. Good evening, my name is Jana Meyer and I'm a Clark County resident. Thank you guys for having us here tonight. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one here with young kids. I don't know, anybody that's, um, or grandparents, there you go. So I, when I my, when my kids were younger, I loved coming to story time. But I got to tell you, when you got a little one and another one in a stroller and a diaper bag, and you're worried where your Cheerios are and you're schlepping all this stuff around, you're just trying to get there, right? And it's you know you want your kid to come there and just have a good time and learn. And you're not necessarily looking for some big divisive issue or a whole bunch of questions and you've got a field that maybe your children aren't ready for, or it's just not age appropriate or it's not age appropriate for their younger sibling who has, who's along in tow with you. Um, and the second point I have is I love story time. I love the idea of reading to kids. My question is, why does it have to be a drag queen? I mean, you're gonna get the question, what's a drag queen mom? I don't really want to have to have that conversation. I'm sorry. Can you stop the time for a second? If there's conversations you need to have, I understand. Please just step outside to do it and then you can come back. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's a conversation I may not want to have with my five-year-old trying to explain what an adult sex entertainer is and what that is as a profession. What does it have to do with teaching kids how to read 
you know, I just, it's just such a divisive thing. I mean, I think we can all as parents choose when and where and how we want to address the, that content, you know, with our children. And it just seems like at the library during a simple story time just really isn't the place for it. Um, I say these things with, you know, no hate or malice in my heart. And, but, you know, I'm loving to all my neighbors and friends. It just, I just don't feel like it really needs to be in little kids story time. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Bob Liggett, followed by Tiffany Hine. I'm Bob Liggett from Washougal. The way a person thinks doesn't change things that are biologically or naturally true. I can think gravity does not exist, but I still I will still be subject to its presence in our natural life. If we go into a bank and tell them that we identify as a millionaire, they will not give us the money. If we go into a hospital and declare that we identify as a surgeon and ask for our patients, they would not comply. Why? Just because we believe something doesn't require others to agree to pretend it is true. They live in a world of reality. But who does live in a world of make-believe? Children. It is not unusual for them to pretend to be something other than what they are. They may imagine themselves as animals or superheroes, or they may have an imaginary friend, and this is normal for them, but it is also, they are also the most vulnerable, needing most protection. They can all, always be put in positions of danger if not protected. It's been said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became an adult, I put away childish things. When the adults around children act like adults, then the children are free to be children. But when the adults around them don't act like adults, then the children are forced to attempt to figure things out for themselves. Many times that is dangerous. I hope that the board will protect those that need protecting. Our next speaker is Tiffany Hine, followed by Jean Slagle. Good evening, board. Thank you for having us. Drag queens with their transvestic fetishisms have no place playing out their desire to entertain and read inappropriate books to children in the library. The general public would be appalled if someone in blackface would be reading books to children at the library. Why is this any different? I find it interesting that, that at these board meetings that I have attended about drag queens being argued for and against, have not made their presence known at these board meetings arguing for their own case to read books to children. It goes to show that their cause is nothing more than a political stunt to cause divisiveness in the community and with its library. Drag queens do whatever it is that you have to do, but in public exhibit some decency and moral decorum and leave the children alone. Our next speaker is Jean Slagle, followed by Alexis Staples. This is my second year anniversary uh, moving here from the Seattle area. And I have uh, grandkids. It's the usual reason why we move here. This issue, the library has come up. In my background, a library is the traditional place that you go for reading. The fact that now we're debating whether the children must be read to by someone in a kind of a costume um, is questionable. I've heard Tonight, it starts off with a lot of accusations of those people who are haters here. So right off the bat, there's a little conflict with throwing accusations back and forth at each other. And all we want to really do was bring our grandkids here to learn to read. Uh, when did we graduate to having 
others reading to the children. I guess that's been around for a while. But then it's transitioned over to having someone in a dress reading to the children. This is con now controversial. And you hear this hate here, hate there. Um, I'd like to keep this library and bring my grandkids here for reading only. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexis Staples, followed by Don Sieber. Hi, my name is Alexis. My pronouns are she, her. Reading is a basic human right. To read a book that includes or even mentions the struggles that you're going through can save lives. Reading books that say it is okay to question who you are and who you want to be, who you love and how you love are very important to a child's development. By taking these books away, you are telling children that who they are is not okay, that those questions should not be asked. And that is not okay. That can kill kids who are searching for who they are. Don't ban books. Books are knowledge, and knowledge should never be denied. Thank you. Our next speaker, Don Sieber, followed by Teresa Valentine. Hi, I'm Don Sieber. Um, I got involved in this push against transgender ideology when women's bathrooms and locker rooms were first opened to, uh, to men in Washington state. My daughter was 14 then, and that just wasn't going to work for me. My daughter just turned 22, so I've been at this a while. One of the first groups that I got involved with was Hands Across the Aisle, a coalition of Christian women, radical feminists, and lesbians. So this is not a left-right issue. This is not a Christian versus non-Christian issue. This is about protecting women and children. I've talked to mothers whose families have been torn apart over this issue. I have done tons of research. I have got facts and stats coming out of my ears, many of which I've shared here. That first study that was mentioned today was actually uh, stats on people who had gone through sex reassignment, a long-term study, and the rate of suicide was 19 times greater than the general population. That's after sex. So that was showing that it's not a panacea. It doesn't fix all the problems. Anyway, I started speaking out against Drag Queen Story Hour at the, from the first, and I attended all three of them. But what's been missing these last four years is any rationale for exposing young children to adult entertainment performers and the idea that they could be trapped in the wrong body. There is massive as evidence they're being harmed by this agenda. But there's no study, no evidence showing kids benefit from interacting with drag queens and being made to question their gender. All the other side has is name calling and basis accusations, which we keep hearing over and over. At this point, what I'd, I'd really like to know what is the library's position or policy going to be regarding these drag queen story hours? If they're gonna to continue to hold them out there as a possibility, please let us know and give us the rationale for that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Valentine, followed by Doreen Turpin. Hello, my name is Teresa Valentine. My pronouns are yes, ma'am. What's the difference between drag queen story hour and blackface? You are entitled, you are entitlement. Confused. Please direct your comments up here toward us and please keep Transgender silent. Transgender politics are entitlement confused. This is a religious matter. Transgendered people worship their own fluid truths. I ask many pro-gender tra or tra pro-transgender people how do you determine right from wrong? I usually get two answers. One answer is that they decide for themselves. Then they are worshiping themselves because worshiping someone means to give more value to that individual than to anyone else. The other answer to my question, how do you decide right from wrong, often is science. Censored science is not science at all. It is politics and dependent on the uncommitted, simple-minded, who believe in a fluid so-called truth. I don't care how much you cut and tape and sew on your external features or how much you drench yourselves with external hormones that your body did not produce itself. You will never be able to change your chromosomes. Trans women will never be able to produce an egg and I will never be able to produce a sperm no matter how much I feel like I should. 
fluid truth is subject to the individual's changing impulses. What if our civil authorities decided that the oath they took to serve and protect us was a fluid oath and could change it at any moment? Man's science is just as much a religion as Christianity, but man's science is constantly changing at the whim of flawed minds of men. You speak of trans persecution. You have no high road on this matter. Millions and millions of Christians have been martyred for their faith by people with your beliefs. Just as much as you think you can decide what's Time. right and wrong for my children, then I should be able to decide what's right and Time. wrong for yours. Our next speaker is Doreen Turpin, followed by Mike Hartiku. Um, as you said, I'm Doreen Turpin. I'm not going to address drag queen story time. I am going to address the library board's responsibilities. I understand that your position is very difficult. You each have your personal feelings. And I know those from hearing comments that have been made, questions that have been asked uh, in meetings that I've attended or seen online, that you align a lot with your concerns about safety for children. So I do want to remind you of some of the responsibilities that you have. One of those, and this is in your trustee ethics and responsibilities, is to support the district efforts to meet library and information needs of all patrons. You hear very much from the people who have been coming and coming and they're very organized. I think the first speaker tonight spoke to the more disorganized people who have individually come forward to speak. I've heard before there's like 4,000 names on a petition. I would remind you that there are over 428,000 people in the district that you serve. Each of these has individual needs and individual ideas on what's appropriate. The second piece that I wanted to address out of your policies is the that uh, you are bound to be prepared to support the efforts of library staff in resisting censorship. Censorship takes many different forms. It can be oppression of certain kinds of programs, books, materials, labeling. There's all different ways. And I implore you to undertake your responsibility very seriously. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike, followed by our final speaker of the evening, Chuck Miller. Hello, I'm Mike Hartlow, and I'm here to talk about uh, Drake Queen Story Hour. Here is my library card, which I, I am proud to have, but I'm more proud of, uh, I'm a multi-generational person here for Clark County, so this community, uh, Southwest Washington and Clark County is, is important to me. And I've only came to a few of these, but it came up, I couldn't attend the last one, but it came up is that we want to ban things, we're wanting to ban things. There's no banning. It's uh, that, if that's the case, if we're banning things, that would be we're banning movies, an R-rated movie. We're, we're that that definition. We're banning that because you can't take a seven-year-old, and you shouldn't take a seven-year-old. That that's the same agenda with Drake Queen. So we're just trying to set age appropriate for it. That's the whole point of it. Age appropriateness for that. We're not trying to ban it. A lot of these books that they're mentioning, they're not banned. They're set age appropriate to it. A 16-year-old's not supposed to be buy cigarettes. There, there's a separate, but a, but I can, I don't, but I can. There's a difference. This this term banning is getting just used ridiculously. It's it, it's not fitting the context. It's not banning. It's setting age appropriate stats. But uh, more importantly, or I don't know about more importantly, but it would be nice to just see. It seems like this world we are. It's just uh, nobody can even agree to disagree. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of us in, the, in this room have things that we like to do, even though we're maybe on up opposite side of the aisles. I'm sure there's multiple people like to garden. I like to garden. I'm sure there's people that don't agree with my views. Let's try to get along. I mean, maybe we like to fish. Maybe we like to hike. Maybe we like corgi puppies. Who doesn't like corgi puppies? <laughs> I'm just saying this. I mean, I'm approachable. I know I'm wearing the teal shirt, but I would like to stop this divide. Thank you. Chuck Miller. Yes. Good evening, Chuck Miller, Clark County. Yeah, I really appreciate you letting us be here tonight. And our main concern is, you know, this drag queen story hour. Some of them are these drag, so-called drag queens or pedophiles. And, and our main concern 
is for protecting our little children that are getting all messed up and with all these books being read to them they don't know they you know they can be a boy they can be a girl they can switch back and forth i mean it, it it's really messing these children up so we this is why we're opposed to it and saving the lives of the children should be your main concern so this is this is why we're here and you know biologically there are only two genders okay there is male and female biologically that's it so consequently please do not have any more drag queen story hours to mess up these children that are so many of them are committing suicide because they're so messed up inside thank you so much thank you we do we still have time left in that room <clears throat> Since we still have time left, is there anyone who did not sign up who would like to make a comment? Go ahead. Um, we'll start with you, and then you can be next in the back. Yeah. Uh, please state your name and uh, the, your city of residence. Um, excuse me, I've never done this, and I'm a little nervous. So, my name is Amanda Stebbitz. Um, I live here in Washougal. Um, I am German, Scottish. I'm also Native American. Um, being my background and my family's background, I know a lot about, uh, sorry, about the Nazi regime and what it's like to be colonized. I also am in part of the LGBTQ community. Um, I've studied biology and I've heard a lot of uh, things here coming out of, coming from people that I believe you guys truly wanna protect children. I really believe that with all of my heart. Um, I also believe that some of you may not, may be ill-informed or not understand these communities and who they are and what they are. I've heard a lot of comparisons to blackface and the difference between that is blackface is a racist term and somebody mocking with bigotry towards race. LGBTQ community is not in mockery or race. It's truly who they are. And if you study biology, the truth is in biology chromosomes. Um, in the sense, it's also a mockery towards my traditions. In Native American traditions, there's always been, in many tribal communities, more than one gender identity. These gender identities have been honored, and people who are considered two-spirit were honored as medicine people. These were part of our traditions before Europeans came and stole that from us. If you study history and you study our cultures, this is not only an attack on people who live today or who are trying to struggle just to be themselves, just to be honored for who they are, just to be honored for biologically who they are inside. It's also an attack on the culture of the original people of this land. The this idea of two genders is the idea of colonization. People have been struggling to be who they are for hundreds of years Time. due to colonization and these ideas. Time. I ask the library to protect this. Thank you. Hello, my name is Riel Lord. I'm a resident of Washougal. I've attended several of these meetings and I went to that library many times growing up and I've gone to the Camus one growing up a lot too. Never quite made it out to the Vancouver. The whole point is, I went to this library many times. We got simple books, and most often there were magicians, puppet shows, and the like. When I'd go to them as a child, I looked to that person, I thought I would come home, I want to be a magician suddenly. Next one would be, I want to be a puppeteer, I guess. And I always looked to these people as, I want to be that when you're older, because that's, as you're a kid, you're a malleable mind. Um, my main point is just uh, let's not do another drag queen story hour. We often, the kids oftentimes look to these people you go to and you want to be that. How many times have we wanted to be the person we see on TV, the person you see on stage, the person you see because you're taken to these events. And so to protect the kids from that, just don't do another drag queen story hour. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Melissa Beck. I woke up about four and a half years ago. 
started dealing with a lot of abuse. A lot of people thought that I did something to deserve that because of substance, not the case. Sorry to interrupt. I believe you turned off the microphone. And still to this day, I've not gotten an explanation from anyone. All I'm asking, and I have figured it out by now, is that people are honest with me. And I also hope that they begin treating it as if it was their own daughter. And any suggestions you have is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. We have a little bit of time left. Is there anyone else who wanted to give comment? I'm sorry, the mic is not on. It just got turned off again. Thank you. My name is Emily Hancock and I live in the Vancouver area. Um, there are two specific ideas that I wanted to address that I've heard tonight. Um, one is the idea that biologically there are only two sexes. That is just simply not true. Biologically speaking, intersex people have always existed. Intersex people are as prevalent as redheads. Do you believe that because redheads are rare that they just don't exist? And that there's only blonde and brown hair? Gender is not binary. Sex is not binary. And it's important that we understand the facts of biology and what biologists and scientists have understood for a very long time. Secondly, there seems to be an idea that being trans is a mental illness that causes you to be more likely to commit suicide. That is not true. Being trans is, it is a phenotype of the human experience. And what leads to the prevalence of mental illness and suicide is the way that trans people are stigmatized. I am autistic. There is a movement to cure autism because people who are autistic have higher likelihood of mental illness and suicide. But the reason why we have a higher likelihood of mental illness and suicide is not because we are autistic. It is because of the way we are treated because we are autistic. And that is what I really want to express is that being trans is not a mental illness. Trans people deserve love and they deserve to be treated as humans. So please examine your values on that. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? That concludes our public comment then. Um, let's see. Thank you all for coming to make your comments. I really appreciate that. Um, I know it takes a lot of time to wait in line and things. Um, next, the Fort Vancouver Regional Library District Board of Trustees will now meet an executive session to discuss personnel as allowed by RCW 4230110. The Board of Trustees will be in executive session until, so it's uh, 53, 13 after. Okay. Until 6.13 p.m., 7.13 7 13 p.m., um, the Board of Trustees is not expected to take further action following the executive session. 7.15. Okay. And uh, we'll just, return at 7.15. And just as a reminder, housekeeping reminder, if you need to use the restroom, you can um, do so through the, egg, uh, the entrance just outside the door to the right. Are we? We're not meeting the library. Oh no, they're going to the library. You're probably you're probably gonna need a key. You got one? Got it. Okay. Yeah, we're just gonna keep it. I'm gonna put up the agenda and call it a day. Well, I won't call it a day. Just throw a plan. What? Sure. Yes, I will. That's a good point. Yeah. And if anybody else joins, I'll be sure to do that too.
Don't worry about it. I won't sue you. I'm now calling the regular meeting back to order. Next on the agenda, um, we'll move on to the reports. First, we'll start with the facilities report with Dave Josephson. Greetings, members of the board and our communities who I humbly serve. <clears throat> My name is Dave Josephson and I'm the facilities and fleet director for our district. Our teams who I support have been active over the last several months working between raindrops. <clears throat> As you know, the 1st of February, we revised and streamlined the way we conduct our courier schedules and routes. The core drive behind this movement was to lower annual fuel expenses, lower vehicle maintenance costs, lessen our impact on the environment and provide a more flexible schedule for our staff to prevent burnout. We are about three months into the plan and have the early findings are incredible. Morale has changed dramatically. Fuel savings are very noticeable, and the team is beginning to learn more about our district buildings inside and out. Three Creeks Library has been a small focus for our facilities team and contractors as we replace the ceiling tiles in the community room and a patch of rough spot on the library ceiling. A new AD operator and hardware will soon be installed onto the front doors also when the parts arrive. We rented a small scissor lift recently and spent some time traveling around the district with it serving seen regular out of reach areas. We replaced bulbs at Vancouver, Battleground, and even some light poles here and there. I headed up to Spokane recently and retrieved a new Metris van to be used by our outreach and partnership team. I am excited to see this van reach our rural areas and provide a wide range of services. Our Brush Prairie site now has a temporary fence around the lot to help cut down on after hour activities, semi-truck parking, and to be good neighbors and stewards to those around the site. We have done our best to not disturb operations center staff as we walk movers and contractors through in preparation of the pending move. We are still targeting the date in early July to move from OC to the remodeled building on Grand. The Grand project is moving slower than I would like with painting just finishing up last week the concrete floors are polished and the walls are painted, but the drop ceiling is a long ways off from being finished. All the rough wiring is now complete. Low voltage wires are in and the constant push to meet the deadline is always there. Many products are so unpredictable on timelines. Some arrive within days of order. Others are long lead items with no date set. The Woodland Library pro ground up project is still on track to go out for bid soon and we'll hope to present a contractor in mid July. Here in Washougal, the building that will be adjacent to our library is gearing up to start. I have met with the contractor on site several times to discuss use of our property and be good neighbors to the adjacent dentistry office. The new building next to our library is slated to start mid-May mid of this year. <clears throat> That's my report, and I sure appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Washougal Community Library with Zoe Nash. Hi, it's actually Zoe. So I'm the branch manager. Very nice to see everyone, meet everyone. Um, so um, as you may have seen, we are a small neighborhood library. Um, we open six days a week. We're open Monday um, through Saturday from 10 to 6. Um, we have six staff members, including myself, and we have a lot of wonderful subs. Uh, that come and help us out. Um, last year in 2022, uh, we served over 86,000 uh, materials. Um, and this current building was built in 1981. Um, and over the, I don't know, last 40 years, um, Washougal's population has probably quadrupled. So we've kind of outgrown our space just a little bit. Um, but we do have a new library building on the horizon. 
Um, so our new location for our library building is on the corner of Maine and Dorgan, and that is just across the street here. Um, and that was donated um, to FARL <clears throat> by Lone Wolf Development. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, um, this is just a little preview if you can play the video. Um, we don't have to watch the whole thing, but um, just kind of gives you an overview of what the architects have imagined. Um, and this was created in conjunction with um, community input. Just so you get a, the gist of what it is. <laughs> Um, so we have a really dedicated um, group of friends um, that fundraise for us. Um, here's a couple of their book sales. Um, so they're working to raise money for our new library. They're working to support the programs um, in our library. Um, and so we're very lucky to have them. Um, we also have our foundation who uh, helps fundraise for us as well. Um, so this past year in August, we had a novel night up at the Get Together Farm uh, to raise some money for our new library building. Um, and we're hoping to have a similar event uh, in 2023. I don't know, stay tuned. Um, we'll see what's going on. Um, next. Uh, um, but you know, while we're waiting for our library building, that doesn't mean we're not uh, out in the community. Um, we're trying to build community. Um, and so we're doing that through our partnerships, through outreach, um, through programs. Um, so here you see a partnership with the Walsh Google School District um, where we brought some STEM kits um, on the left there, the kids are making a robot prototype um, with some hummingbird prototyping boards that are owned, these kits that are owned by FARL. And then here, um, I believe is a third grade class and they're working with um, electric circuits. Um, and we're also doing outreach in the community. Um, so on the left here, we have, um, that is a story time up um, at a nature center up a Washougal River Road. And then this is a Spanish speaking uh, outreach event. It's one of our staff members there as well. Um, and then we're just working to kind of connect with our community. So we've been having lots of programs and ways that we can kind of reach out to the community and provide things um, for them. So here we have our family story time and we have a couple of staff members um, that provide story times. Um, that's twice a week, uh, some in the morning, some in the afternoon. Um, and then this one's my favorite is this kid with this slime in his hand. Um, so we made slime this past year and that was really fun. Um, and then here we have some kids that are celebrating uh, library card sign up month. And so they kind of they got to decorate uh, their own library card holders. And we also have a monthly STEM um, program and a monthly art program. Um, so here's some kids made some rocket launchers with uh, marshmallows, and this was in October, and we're still finding marshmallows in the library. <laughs> uh, go to the next slide. Um, and then this was just uh, for our spring break week of fun. So not last week, but the week before was spring break, and so every day of spring break we had a fun activity for the kids. So we did some sewing, and then this was my favorite. Um, they got to dig for fossils, and I got to live my childhood dreams there <laughs> being an archaeologist. So that was really fun. Um, so we we've got lots of lots of stuff going on um, at our branch um, for for families and for kids um, and for adults. Just the the pictures are more photogenic of the kids programs. Um, and if, for those of you that don't know, we also have a special um, well, kind of special um, as a seed library. Um, so you can come and check out seeds and plant them in your garden. And then um, at the end of the season, you can bring back some seeds and then we kind of share them out to the community. Um, so, you know, it's almost springtime. <laughs> so it's time to get started. So you can come check out some seeds at our seed library. And that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Community space here. Uh, and that with all your programs, are you using this? For the space or um so this space actually is a city space and uh -huh. during the um week they have meals on wheels and the senior um, center so it's only available to us some days so the new structure is going to have um a community space in. yes so the new okay. structure has a community space so yeah we can use this space in the evenings generally and then sometimes on saturdays that otherwise it's occupied with city programs yep okay thank you Next, we'll hear from Amelia for the financial reports. Can you put that up for me, Mary? Thank you. Thank you. 
So for the month of February, and if you remember, I feel like I have to say this just about every month, but um, we're now a month in arrears. We used to report prior month, now we're two months behind, um, just so that we have a little more time to get our financials through the county. Um, it was a bit of a crunch for us in the past, so this was a recommendation we took from the CPAs this past year. Um, so for the month of February, um, our cash on hand at the end of the month was $16,661,568. Of that, um, twelve million forty dollars and four hundred twenty-six dollars is uh, funds that we have um, set aside for specific projects, including a budget stabilization fund of one point eight million, leaving four million six hundred twenty-one thousand one hundred forty-two dollars in our operational fund. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, FBRL generally receives property tax twice a year in April and October. Um, so it's normal for our uh, cash fund to be depleted um, in the spring as we head into the uh, month of April. Um, on the um, revenue side, if you roll up for me, um, again, you can see under our property tax revenues, there were $102,249 for the month of February or $169,019. And what I shared with the finance committee is this is pretty typical for us at the end of February. Um, it's about where we normally would be just a little under 1%. Um, these are usually delinquent taxes or just those really zealous people that like to get that off their list right at the beginning of the year. Um, uh, but in general, we see most of those taxes coming in in April. Um, a little bit of leasehold excise tax and a few other things. So the um, total revenue for the month of February was $157,744. And I'm going to check my notes. Um, the one thing I would point out here is um, interest is looking better. It came in at $23,843. And so that's a kind of a positive turn from a, a long year last year of pretty low interest rates. We're, we're already at 25% of budget after just two months. And typically um, for February, when we, we'll see this more on the um, expenditure side, um, typically we expect to be at about 16.5% of our um, total for the year. Um, all right, so moving on to um, expenditures. Um, and again, expenditures are looking typical for us in the month of February. So we're just under 16% on personnel at 15.98%. Um, and again, that's at 16.66%. So we're running just a little under or a little over half a percent below budget. Um, supplies, technology is only at seven and a half percent. So uh, running a little bit behind budget, but often with things like technology, um, we, we buy them um, in groups. So we buy a lot at the same time. So we might have, um, you know, a little less even spending in that area. And our um, professional collection technology, those are a lot of our online databases and those subscriptions often come up later in the year. So um, we may not see as much of that budget spent down for some time. Um, at 11.8% uh, is our materials and electronic resources. So a little bit behind budget. Um, it usually takes us a little bit time to get up to speed um, after we begin spending again in January. And the same on our operations side at 11.34%. Um, a couple of things I'll just point out. It looks like uh, things like miscellaneous dues, printing, those are often, again, things that we pay um, once a year, uh, things like our dues to the Washington Library Association, American Library Association. Um, so sometimes those, those costs will not be as even across the year. Um, we'll definitely be keeping a sharp eye on utilities at 18%, but generally, again, it's winter, we're using more gas um, in the wintertime, so those prices tend to be a little higher, the expenditures tend to be a little bit higher in the wintertime, it should even out in the spring, summer, then electricity bumps up when we turn the air conditioning on, and then the fall it evens out again. So uh, it's pretty cyclical and pretty normal. Um, we spent $168,972 on um, buildings owned, and that was carpet. In uh, February, we were um, paying the last uh, payment on the carpet for the new, van or the new carpet at Vancouver. So expenditures, $2 or about 13.74% of budget. Um, so a little bit 3% below budget on expenditures is where we'd like to be. It looks pretty good to me. Um, if you have any questions. Yes. I don't have the budget in front of me. I was on the on the system, but I'm sure you've um, planned for double um, payroll for the director's position as you go into training and we, we kind of double up for a while there. No? Okay. So if we want some doubling up, we need to think about that. Okay. I, you're not going to, there won't be any doubling. Up. <laughs> <laughs> All 
are you going to be hiding in Greece or someplace like that? <laughs> okay. Any other questions or discussion? So for the library books and materials, like, is there any way you can provide, like, say, for last year, what was the cost per book of the circulated item? <laughs> or even the monthly, just rough estimate is good. Like, say, we, we spent, you know, two million till date, and of that, we have circulated 100,000 items. We've circulated over four million items. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm just giving a rough um, numbers here. So you're looking for cost per checkout, or what are you looking yeah. for? Yes. I mean, I could get you a number just by doing some algebra, but there's a lot more to it than just that. You know, there's the cost of staff and running the buildings and processing the materials. And I, I think what might also be hard to see is some materials circulate more than others um, and it's called turnover rate. And so it varies a lot between books like children's board books turn over pretty quickly. Adult fiction turns over more slowly. Adult fiction is much more expensive than a child's board book. Um, so it's, it's a fairly complex question um, to dig down to a, a, a cost per circ. Um, yeah, based on, based on materials, I think it's probably more interesting for us to be thinking of it more on a cost per um, circulation of the total cost of the district. You know, what does it cost to operate and, and how much, you know, because I think by by item, if we're trying to go by item, it's, you know, an, an ebook might cost us $89 and a board book might cost us 10, you know, mm -hmm. um, it could be fairly, fairly yeah, different. That, that will also help in like, Distinguishing between, you know, what's the cost of a physical book versus an ebook, and is it like ten times expensive to have ebooks? It depends. Versus... Yeah, it it varies greatly yeah. between even just between different books titles and which vendor we buy them from, and what the licensing is. A bestseller is going to be more expensive than a, you know. And have we like even done like an internal study or given a thought to like if you have a physical book? of the same, like a same physical book and an ebook. If you don't keep ebook, does your physical book have the same demand, right? Versus if you, you know, have an ebook, yes, people will take it. They just go and check it out. She's, she's ready. I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, for the people online, this is Lynn Caldwell speaking. Um, so uh, periodically, about, about once every quarter, I go through and get all the barcodes from Overdrive, which is our primary um, ebook vendor. And Brenda Cameron, our systems analyst, she um, uses those numbers and does a comparison to see how many people are checking out physical, how many people are checking out digital, and how many are checking out both. And it really is kind of like people have picked a lane. There's maybe like a little sliver of about 10% that do both, and the rest is either E or physical. So I don't think if we did or didn't have a physical book, someone may or may not then just go to the digital book. People really kind of have that. That's, you know, it's not a, a scientific study, but we find it every time we do it, it's about the same numbers. Do you think that's going to change over time? I'm um, not sure because the cost of eBooks, I, I, you know, theoretically, I feel like eBooks, are easier to use me i'm a i'm 54 but i have a 10 year old so when i read to him at night in bed i can't see the physical book i have to use the the kindle because i can adjust the lighting and the size of the font <laughs> and so that i can read to him you know so i do just uh ebooks with my son but um, because of the cost um you know generally speaking a hardback uh, bestseller might be 25 dollars or 30 dollars but we have to pay the ebook is maybe 80 dollars you know, I learned that early on the board and it was a shock because I was walking around thinking we were saving money. Mm -hmm. And I think that they need, we need a message out to the public, not in a, you know, rah, 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 but hey, it's costing us more now because you are using ebooks. They think we're saving them money with the ebooks. 
Yeah, but then I also don't have to shelve it. So, you know, I don't have to pay someone to shelve it. So that's pretty They're, minor. Though. You can go either way, you know. Thank you, Lynn. I, and I think one of the other bigger issues for us is the licensing. We don't own those eBooks and we own the physical books. And that's, that's a huge difference for us because those books only check out so many times and then they disappear and we either have to buy them again or hope, like you said, that people will be satisfied with a print copy um, over the e-copy. Well, it's going to be tricky to monitor that to see if we're going to have to be building up more money to get circulation material. Well, and I, I think the discussion may come at some point of how many ebooks copies do we purchase versus how many print copies, and we try to drive more users to borrowing print because print ultimately is is the better deal for us. Um, the couriers won't be needed as much. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I'll say, did she say it in the microphone? <laughs> microphone. You're... Oh, there you go. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> but they did it online. The go ahead and say it again, please. I did go through all of the financials. I had a online wonderful time, but uh, they were well done. I appreciate uh, the work these people do for that. Yes, they did. Is there a second? A second. Any further discussion? I move this for a, a vote, please. Penny Love Hensley. Aye. Marie Coffey. Aye. Bikram Katwani. Aye. Mary Ann Duncan Cole. Aye. Megan Dugan. Aye. And Christy Morgan. Aye. Motion passes. Next up is business. Um, we'll start with policy committee personal handbook. This is our first reading, um, just informational. Lee, do you want to make any comments about the updates to the personnel manual? <laughs> okay, I, I can I did a, a staff report on it. Um, and I'll just kind of hit on the high points here and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so essentially, um, we have had to add a few things. We last updated this in 2018. Um, so primarily um, attire, personal property, telecommuting, uh, visitors in the workplace, social media, FBRL issued electronic devices, benefits, compensation, leave, privacy, personal visitors and emergencies. Those are the items. Um, if you go through the um, revised version of the um, personnel handbook that you'll find um, have either um, been added to or um, amended in some way. Um, we also um, have a description in there for person in charge, uh, which is a uh, parameters for those serving in um, supervisory roles um, for short periods of time. We've added the new equity policy and we are absorbing the political paraphernalia wearing and display in libraries policy <laughs> into the text. And all of those changes are indicated by red lines and highlights. Um, so we're looking for your input um, on that. And I've given you the current version and uh, the revised version. The one thing um, that I want to make a note of is there's a letter at the very beginning of the uh, handbook that's from me and that we're going to delete. That's not part of policy. And um, so my expectation is, you know, that'll be revised and, and added as necessary. But it's really kind of a, a welcome letter. Um, after a policy committee last time, I spent some time going through this, and I found it kind of hard to follow the changes because, the, like, when you get to 
some of the later pages, there's things that are pulled out from other areas and kind of put in between. It would be easier, I think, to evaluate this if we had, you know how you usually do the lines through things? Um, so it's kind of hard to, to figure out what was and what is now. Um, but under um, professional ethics on page um, 63 of our packet, point nine, um, it seems like it's already covered in all the rest of them and a bit repetitive. So I was just wondering why, if we could take that out or, I mean, one through eight covers all of that. I think that's because it's from the ALA policy that's that's basically copied directly into it. Because the previous page, it shows the website that this mm -hmm. comes from. Um, just because ALA has it doesn't mean we have to adopt it, though. So are you saying, Christy, that you would want to take all of the ALA professional ethics out of the handbook then? Because that entire section is from the ALA. I'm session. saying that I don't understand why we're adding nine just because ALA has it. I think Lee is. We had quoted the entire ethics policy or ethics from ALA and what had changed as number nine was added between 2018 and this revision. So is this our policy or ALA's policy? Because we can take what fits us. Is that not correct? Or I mean, we can take what fits our library and put it into our policy, correct? We can, Okay. but we have chosen to do the entire ethics, not pick and choose numbers out of ALA's ethics. Well, we get to pick and choose though. You can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm saying that I feel that one through eight covers it, nine's repetitive. And I don't I don't think we need to add an additional paragraph there. I think there's an implication that by having it there and having the uh, the link to it, that we are quoting the entire one. So I think if we want to pick and choose, we should put some language in there that we are um, not we doing could, the entire. We could delete the link. It's our policy. I feel it's rep it's repetitive. We're talking. I mean, I could read them all if you want me to. So we're talking. Okay, I just feel it's kind of repetitive. Is all. I feel like this is a huge book, and to be adding more to it when we're already saying the same things is just a little bit repetitive. So just adding few lines would not really make any difference in a book, which is more than sixty pages long. Right, and that that particular item does talk about, you know, removing individual biases, which I don't see in any other points. So if we are, you know, taking all the code of ethics from ALA, we we can include those. I agree with Vic. I don't think there's anything else in one through eight that says anything about uh, racial and social justice or diversity and inclusion, and I don't feel comfortable taking out. Uh, that one statement since it's an update to ALA's professional ethics, which the library staff is saying that they want to follow. Okay. Other discussion? If I could just make a point of clarification, um, FERL is an institutional member of the American Library Association. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we have to use all their policies? No, but, okay. but we go out of our way to um, support them as our professional organization as librarians. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. So um, ALA, we are a member, right? Yes. And so we take what fits our district from them and we don't have to take it all. Okay. Correct, but I think, um, you know, I, I would support the position that, you know, these are the professional ethics that are laid out for us. Um, and they're in this, because we'd want to support them. Okay, other discussion? Uh, let's see, so where it got on page 70 of the board packet, I just wanted to make sure that what is here already existed. It's kind of confusing where it came from before. Is it just shifted around a little bit? 
like I was going back and forth between the two and I found bits in other places. Is that all it is? Like the white parts are just moved? Lee, can you respond? The white parts, the white parts are what we had before. We added in the equity statement and that other paragraph. Okay. But what's there is what we had had in the past. Okay in the personnel manual if it would just be easier going forward if we could have like lines through so we can see it easier instead of flipping back and forth i, I think the reason it's highlighted is because nothing was deleted these were simply it added. doesn't it doesn't match though i mean oh. i was looking back and forth and it doesn't match but that's fine i just think going forward if we could please make notations where we move things to okay we'll take a look at that christy we had provided a track changes version in the past and was asked to remove that and that was <laughs> difficult to read. Okay. So I hear you. Uh, trying to highlight what, what we knew was different. Okay. Um, and then I, I had a question about um, all complaints. I know this is already there. Page 70 of our packet at the bottom. Um, all complaints will be investigated appropriately and promptly. The identity of the employee making the complaint, as well as the identity of the individual accused of discrimination, will be kept as confidential as is reasonably possible. My question is, um, if someone's accused of something, do they get to know who's saying who the accuser is, so to speak? If it moves to the formal discipline process, okay. yes. Okay. Not necessarily in the fact-finding part, but if we're going to... Um, if we're going to move into the formal disciplinary process, they have the right to know. Okay. I'm trying to let other people jump in if they have questions. Okay. The political paraphernalia, I like that that is in the policy now instead of separate. Um... I had one more question. Page, oh, page 105 of the packet. Um, at the top, equal opportunity and affirmative action. Um, we had a presentation from Lee that talked about our hiring practices and I just, can someone help me understand how page, it was page 105 again. Yeah. The beginning um, of chapter nine. Yeah. Recruiting, hiring, promotions, performance. Um, it says FERL provides equal opportunity for all employees and applicants for employment, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex. Um, so can someone help me understand how that fits with, I feel like Lee, before you said you had to make sure we had certain types of people in our pool? Do those clash or can you help me understand that? This is the formal language out of the equal opportunity law. Mm -hmm. So it's the groups that are protected by law. Yeah. But we work to have as diverse of a workforce as we can outside and include, including these components and outside of that. So we're looking to make our um, employee population more match the communities that we work in. And so if you look at libraries, we tend to be 70% uh, female. And so we want to kind of up that number of males if we can. So it's more than just the legal requirements. So you do look at sex when you're picking the candidates? Not necessarily when we're picking the candidates, we look at what our, uh, our employee, uh, employee pool looks like and look at that data, we might try to have a broader pool of male candidates for a position. Doesn't necessarily mean we would pick them because they were male, but we would want a broader pool of applicants. So you might pull male in, like, so would you pull a male in over like a female then? If Not if they don't meet the min quals, the minimum qualifications for the job. We would go out and try to go places and recruit okay. candidates so that we had a, a plumper pool. Okay, but they, you know, that you have to meet the minimum calls to get in the door and get to be part of the uh, the hiring process. Thank you. I have a question regarding this wearing of political paraphernalia. 
It's page 71. So here it says you are not allowed to wear any political, you know, which, you know, endorses or opposes a political viewpoint. But some of the topics like the LGBTQ, right, they become politicized over a period of time. It can be any such, you know, topic. So are they not allowed to wear any of those? Or how do you distinguish between what they are allowed, what they are not allowed? Sorry. Well, I can answer in, in the way that, I, from my perspective, it's not, to me, LGBTQ is not political. It's not affiliated with any uh, particular political party. It's more having to do with the persons, um, with themselves and how they express themselves. Um, I will also note that we do have restrictions on what graphic um, link, you know, words and um, t-shirts folks can wear, um, which is covered in our dress code, which I believe is after this in before. It's, it's, it's in the first before. chapter. It's in the first chapter um, is covered, you know, what, what kinds of clothing and um, um, messages folks can wear specifically restricted to reading, literacy, and library um, type messages. So but if somebody wanted to wear a tie-dye rainbow shirt, they could wear that. It's not a graphic per se, but if they had um, words, a slogan on it or something along those lines, that, that's not allowed within the policy. Would it be better if there were just no buttons? We do have buttons that are sanctioned by the library for people to wear. We also, um, on special events, will make buttons. Sometimes they do it at the branches for programs and or special events. We do have several buttons that are, uh, we have pronoun buttons that we allow employees to wear. They're generated by our graphics department. So would it be better if instead of political, it is, you know, specific to say if it is racist or something that are not allowed versus making a general statement? Because as I mentioned, over a period of time, many topics become politicized, whether they come under First Amendment, Second Amendment, doesn't matter, everybody has a view. Right? Gun control, LGBTQ, these are just few topics which are very biased from you know individual and political perspective. So one can put a stop if you want to based on if you're saying it can be political or not. Mm -hmm. Vic, I, I think the intent of the political paraphernalia is really around a couple of things. One is library elections. Um, so employees can't wear a button that says vote for the library if we're on the ballot. That's against the law in Washington. We can't promote something. Um, the other thing would be, um, Oh gosh, I've lost my train of thought about it. Thinking of like a political campaign or a, somebody running for office, um, those are those are things again we're restricted by law in Washington from so promoting. Can you put that specific language saying, okay, if it's a campaign, you're not allowed to do that, versus making a general statement where it can be interpreted either way. You know, we can, we can, we basically are taking the language, I think, straight from the existing political paraphernalia policy. So we could take a look at that and see if we can come yeah, up with some different language. Thank you. I'd like to go to page 114. Um, and we're talking about the foundation in the F, uh, F, uh, Fort Vancouver Regional Library. And the issues that we're having um, it right I now. I think, Marianne, that's the yeah. next topic. Oh, OK. OK, you're going to just... That's past the end of the personnel manual. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yes. OK. Yeah. That's next. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't know what she was talking about. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I read the whole thing and just went, oh, why is that in there? <laughs> Other questions or discussion on the handbook? So this is the first reading, and then we go back and have a second reading, and do we vote on it in the second reading? Um, you'll vote on it when it's on the consent agenda, and that'll be typically a third time for okay. you. Thank you.
Um, I would encourage you, if you guys think of anything between now and the next policy committee, feel free to email Amelia um, with suggestions about the handbook. If you, It's really thick, so make sure you read it and email if you think of anything. Have you had any issues in the past two, three years that you found difficulty with our, our personnel policy addressing those issues? Whoever, yeah. Whichever. Is that Lee? I'm going to let Lee respond. We've had things that laws have changed that aren't reflected in the personnel manual. Um, so we've had some challenges that way in the making sure that employees know what the new laws are and that they can follow them. So we don't have, um, this is the document that we use in conjunction with the collective bargaining agreements to kind of direct people on what the rules are going to be. I don't think that we've had specific um, specific personnel employee type issues that have been driven by the manual. Uh, quick comment on the staff use of electronic e equipment. So there is no language in here which says that they cannot use it for, you know, say for hosting a website of their own or you know, run a Bitcoin mining out of their <laughs> laptop. Those are very common things these days, which really deteriorate the quality of your, you know, laptops or desktops if done. Mm -hmm. It's uh, page 75. Mm -hmm. I thought there was something forbidden there. I can't tell you what page it was. Yeah. Four. Chapter four. Page. Don't have a clue. I don't have numbers on them. It's electronic communication systems guidelines and restrictions. I'm up to chapter three. <laughs> there you go. Very bottom of 37. Thank you. That's the old version. That's the old version. The page 83. Under usage guidelines, electronic communication systems are to be used for business purposes only. It is acknowledged that occasionally it is necessary for employees to use the systems for personal use. Personal use of any FRL electronic communication systems should be kept to a minimum. So some examples we give employees at new employee orientation is maybe you have a child that you have a work cell phone and the child is going to touch you when they get home. We consider that to be somewhat de minimis and allowed personal use. Yeah, but if somebody was mining Bitcoin, we'd have a, we'd have a big. So on, yeah. I think Lee though, on the next page, Vic is what you're looking for under um, computers and laptops on page 84 and then internet access on page 85. Thank you. Did that answer did that answer your question? Kind of. It's not like straightforward. Yeah, this one's a lot of reading. I don't know about mining Bitcoin, but you can't <laughs> download any software or install anything on your FBRL computer or laptop. Would you need to do that to mine Bitcoin? You're not allowed to, yes. <laughs> We're not supposed to you know, that's the example we're going to use now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, oh, can't, you can't host any, you know, pornographic websites from your laptops, computers, or you know, any of that, uh -huh. because those might lead to disciplinary actions straight away, right? There cannot be an excuse on those fronts. So if they are in your policy, right. that will make your life easier if yeah. any of that one-offs happen. 
can't do mm -hmm. internet access kind of goes through some of that about social media, personal use of the internet, right at the top of 85. Yeah, but that still does not address that one off situations. Vic, if you have some suggestions for language, would you send that to me? And yeah, gladly sure. take it. Okay, thank you. I want to keep us moving, but I want to make sure you get your questions answered. Did that, was that okay? Okay. Any other questions about this? We can move on to the foundation policy. I <laughs> I was just having an issue with um, the language the way you talk about the foundation and providing fundraising and financial support before it was not before funding. I don't, I said the comment that the before funding is before funding, but I'm just waiting for you to um, speak to that if you need to be addressed in that way. Marianne, I'm sorry, um, that was not captured on the mic. Oh, sorry, because I. I have to repeat all that. Oh, dear. <laughs> Marianne, perhaps before you repeat that, let me explain what this is. This is a staff report. This is not the actual policy. So what hopefully you gather from reading this is um, the intent of um, Vikram asking me about a policy specific to our relationship with the foundation and asking the policy committee to address that. So what I've done is, is written up a little bit of information for the board on why um, this is something I think the policy committee should take under consideration. But I felt like because we have an MOU with the foundation and this is a departure um, to create a policy um, that it probably needed to be a broader discussion um, before we set the policy committee to work on this. Because it, it's, it would be a new policy. And I think it's um, needed right now. I think there's some tension there and that we should address it, and figure out a way to, to address it so that we're both being satisfied. Do you think that this policy would be a foundation only policy or would it cover in the event we ever had a, another partner in fundraising? Would it just be would you see it as as like a fundraising partner policy or specific to foundation? It it should cover in general. Like say for example, if library wants to do a fundraising event and the foundation doesn't have resources to go through with that, then you know we might engage a different agency. So the same similar you know terms would apply to them also. So more generic title, probably just covering fundraising in general, fundraising partners or something like that. Correct. And we Sorry. can put some language specific for the foundation because that's our major partner for everything. We want everything to go through the foundation, mm -hmm. but the terms have to apply, you know, what library wants. It's not the other way. So we should be, you know, setting the terms of what we expect from the foundation with respect to fundraising and all the expectations. So they live up to that. I, I think this is going to take some debate because I don't know how I want, how confined I want to have a, its own board. It stands alone. It has its own policies. Um, and they've been fairly successful about fundraising. And so I, I think we're going to have to be very careful about how we word that. I think the reports are, yes, we do need reports. Um, but I think this is something we should sit down, maybe a smaller committee and work with the foundation first before we start drafting. We've been trying to do that, Marianne, for the we last year. <laughs> and at this point right now, uh, our next meeting is set in May 18th at three in the afternoon. We have an online meeting with them. Uh, at this point, I have not received back from Debbie the notes from our last meeting. She was going to draft them for us, okay. but she's out of the country, or she's on vacation right now. So I'm waiting for her to get back. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
I think that this has been ongoing for some time and I have a hard question to ask. Um, what does it look like if we no longer partner with foundation? Where my information, I just don't know the paths that we have. We, we would have to look to um, our MOU and to their articles of incorporation and determine what, if this relationship was to end, what that might look like. And if it continues, then we are currently covered by the MOU that stands. That's correct. Status quo. Okay. What would be the consequences of ending? We would wind up in court. Mm -hmm. We would wind up, yeah, legal, uh, legally. They do have termination policies within their bylaws and how they will terminate if needed. But the bigger question would be, at, at some places, the foundations are part of the library. It's just, you know, 501c because that's tax efficient for certain things. So foundations can be part of the library and you know the staffing can be part of the library it's just they are different for taxing purposes only that's the advantage you can do certain things as a foundation being 501c which you can't do with the government entity so keeping that in mind we would you know like to continue you know for them as a foundation but it has to be transparent, very transparent on what they are doing, how they are doing it. And they have to report that to the library. You've worked with other foundations. Can you, are you comfortable telling me if this is normal? I mean, is, are there these types of... It is not unheard of. Okay. Um, I think I shared some information with the MOU committee. Um, just really fortunately, the Urban Library Council, um, another library director just asked the question, how's it going with your foundation? And we got many responses of similarly sized libraries across the United States with foundations. And many of them have excellent relationships. Many of them um, work well together, um, are successful in raising funds. A few are not. Um, and um, often when they are not successful, it's due to a breakdown of communication, um, lacking shared goals, um, that sort of thing. Um, for the committee, wh why, what, it feels like we are hung up on the MOU for some yes. time. Can, do you have any why? Why are we stuck, I guess? Uh, at this point, we went through the MOU and basically agreed to a um, the general bare bones of it. There was about three places where they wanted to have a separate agreement that is not in the MOU. And I'm looking through here quickly. I think one was with the IT department. One was with the graphics department that they said they thought we should have a separate MOU because that's where a lot of the hang up was. So then what does that leave in the M or main MOU? Uh, the main MOU uh, basically is still in order, Okay, uh, okay. but they wanted to have separate policies to deal with. Uh, so to pull IT. out the IT and the, what was the other one? There was IT, uh, graphics department, and I thought there was a third one. Do you remember the third one? And, and just, for the, and just for the record, we presented them with an MOU for communications um, over a year ago. Okay. Yeah. But again, if we are, you know, trying to build a policy, then the MOU as it is now just stands till we finalize and then we go back on the MOU, which, you know, with the policy as our, you know, supporting document. Okay. I guess as part of the policy committee, I, I read this and it sounds like a good idea, um, but generally we've been updating policy. And so to read that we need to partner with MOU committee, but yet we can't have more than three people or it's a a public meeting or 
Yeah. And then um, to write one from scratch, would that be, would you do that part then? Okay. So what does the next steps look like then for this? Um, in a perfect world, I think that meeting on May 18th is critical um, for a decision point for the board where this MOU committee needs to come back with a recommendation to the full board and to the policy committee as to whether or not we're going to make any headway with this specific MOU or if we need to you know, look at a different approach. Have um, you been included in the next meeting? No. Has Rick? Who's all invited? On uh, it's my understanding that uh, they did not want Rick or Amelia in this. Um, so Rick was not at the last meeting. Um, I that's confusing to me because when we discussed this publicly, we were told by the foundation that Amelia and Rick would be included from this point on with discussions of the MOU. So I'm not comfortable moving forward without Amelia and Rick at the next meeting. Yeah, I if they'll agree with it, then then yeah, yeah. the The goal was to pull them out for one meeting and then leave it to the committee when you wanted them back and you're ready for them to come back. Am I understanding that correct? Okay. If Why don't you um so, uh, sort it out and ask that these questions and say this is where where are you? This is where we are. Um, yeah, but the terms of all that MOU will be based on the policy. If you don't have the policy to talk about, then we don't want to move on the MOU. Mm -hmm. So, so because, you're so you're saying you would like the policy before the MOU? Correct. I think we need because to the meet. MOU. Sorry, so the MOU, all the terms that are there, are, you know, we don't want to agree with most of them, the way they are. And what is the basis for this MOU or you know next MOU or next after that? Because we don't have any policy to you know whether you know go for it. whether it's you know this board or the next board or whoever is in charge of that. They need some reference document so that policy would definitely be helpful. Just because we make a policy um, doesn't mean they have to sign the MOU or agree to an MOU. So I'm just wondering if we have the right order. I agree that this policy would be good. I'm just not sure the order of the work um, because we'll still, even if we have a policy, it won't solve this problem, correct? You, once you have the policy, then you base your MOU based on the policy. You will not agree to terms that are, you know, you have specifically mentioned in the policy that you want those specific terms. At this point of time, the MOU is, you know, just a rough document which has been twisted as one party, whoever is powerful, you know, they have done that and they have not given any reports. You, We don't know what that, you know, what the money comes in, how it comes in, what is generated. The library, it, it is for the library. So library yeah, I, should know all those things. I agree. I, I'm not a like I don't think you should create policy in reaction to a certain event, um, specific event specific policy. No, it's not but I'm not, specific policy. I'm not saying that it's not a, a good policy or something we need, right? But I I just I don't I'm not sure I'm understanding how creating a policy right now will help secure an MOU. I'm willing to do it. I just don't know. I don't want to put off meeting with the, um, if we can get them to meet with, with us May, in May, I don't know if we should put it off longer. I, I'm not sure. So my view is that the foundation, you know, as mentioned in their creating documents is there to serve the library mm -hmm. and you know, to raise funds for the library. So if they are generating funds, uh, we don't know what funds are generated, right? And they have at times denied a certain, you know, requests that have been made by the library. So what, we don't know why, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe there are no funds. Maybe there are funds. Maybe they just choose not to sanction those. 
So there is no basis for anything, right? So if those things are very clear on, you know, what the expectations are from the library side, what they should be doing, they cannot say, hey, we are a private foundation, so we are not supposed to give you that. That is not appropriate. We mm -hmm. expect them to share all those details with the, you know, yeah. they can, they can I, keep certain mm -hmm. things like their, you know, donor list and everything, those private if they want to, but other things should be shared. Yeah, that, there is no dispute with that for sure. Um, I agree with all the things you're saying. My my problem is wrapping my arms around the timeline and how we get this done. Um, I don't know what the next step should be. I don't know that I want to put off meeting with them just because we don't have a policy yet. I don't want to just throw a policy together. We have, just, this has been going on for many years now. I so know. Mm -hmm. Waiting another one month or even two months or three months wouldn't make much of a difference because you have your base MOU, which has been going on and it's still there. Yeah, I'd love to hear other board comments. I think that we should be meeting with them. We should ask to have Rick and Amelia included. And if that is not gonna happen, then we need to start work on the policy. Okay. I don't think it should, it needs to be like one or, I think it could be and, you know, we have all these pieces working. Um, Megan, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I heard this right when, um, Amelia, did you say that the staff was going to draft a po potential policy for first reading in May? I, I'm looking for the board's direction. Okay, so that's a possibility. The the staff could assist with drafting. I I, I agree with um, Christy's concerns about the two committees. Um, we don't have overlapping members, so we can't necessarily meet together. There's too many of us. But I do think um, if we uh, could at least have a draft of a policy um, in May, um, that would be good. And and at the same time. I think Amelia and Rick need to be at the May 18th MOU committee meeting. And if, um, I, I, I mean, we just, there's no way to know if that will be happen or not. <laughs> We're also looking at a major change in um, staff at the same time. And I'm wondering how we're going to um, work on this project. We won't be able to implemented, I don't think by um, June or Amelia leaves. So we, we need to be careful about what kind of workload we give ourselves and what kind of compromises are being made there between the two leaders. Well, does the move to the new location have any impact on any of this? Is it, are we beholding to them for that or? I am waiting for their response. So then what, what's next steps for this? We have a meeting next week with the policy committee, with the MOU committee. MOU committee, yeah. So we would have at least a rough draft available for further discussion. That would be helpful, at least bullet points or something yeah. that you have in mind. I'm not even sure what to put in there. So. Yeah. We'll have something were you trying to okay? Hmm. Any other discussion or questions, or we'll just report back after our meetings next time? Yeah, we'll be meeting next week. We can send out an email and, and copy the board on it. Amelia, are no, you? We can't. Yeah. yeah. You can email me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I can and, communicate and with ask everyone. Me to yep. share. <laughs> okay. You. Got it. I did forget I am on the MOU committee and the policy committee. I said that there weren't overlapping members, but I am. An overlapping member. I just forgot that. It's getting kind of late. It's still too many people. <laughs> yeah. Amelia, are you available for the meeting, for the MOU committee meeting in May? I believe I am. Yes, I should be. But okay. I can make myself available. So is there any reason, I mean, we get to decide who we bring, correct? So I, I just heard someone say, like, if they're invited, but we can invite her. So let's do that. Oh yeah, we can okay. we, we can invite her definitely okay. um, and invite him and we can invite him. But we were told by Debbie Jenner John that he was not going to be there. Well, that's his 
their decision. Yeah. And Amelia can still attend. Correct. I'm Am I understanding that correctly? I mean, we get to pick who attends. So even if he says that he, he can't can or won't go, then Amelia can still go. Yes. Okay. Well, let's make sure that that happens. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions or discussion? I have a general comment. Yeah. So the purpose of, you know, first I would like to you know thank everybody for volunteering. It's, you know, they are giving up their precious time for library and community. And same goes out for the staff who are spending extended amount of time for this activity. So the meeting purpose is to conduct library business, right? It's not a platform for general debate. You know, we are not providing uh, open platform for anybody to come and, you know, give their ideological views. So we should respect everybody's time, be it, you know, the board members and the staff, limit the library agenda time and items that are discussed. I'm sorry, which meeting are you talking about? On these open meetings. Okay, board okay, meetings. okay, continue. On the open board meetings. So, you know, just to effectively use everybody's time, we should be mindful of what, how much time we are giving. We are giving one hour at this point of time. We should definitely cut down on that. If they want to talk about, you know, current agenda items, uh, it's open. But general discussions, it should be definitely limited and, you know, looking at, you know, just preserving everybody's valuable time. Thank you, I hear, and I have considered that. Um, however, for now, I'm gonna leave it at one hour and two minutes a person. So does anybody else on the board has any views or it's chair's decision to decide on that? Unless I'm mistaken, I believe it's my decision for public comment. Um, it, it is and it isn't. So some of it's under state law. Yeah. Um, so we do need to provide a public comment period and we cannot dictate what is commented on during that time. We can limit the amount of time and we can limit the number of people, um, but we can't limit what they're going to say. That's an infraction of, against their free speech. Correct, so I'm just saying to limit the amount of time that is given for general public comments. How, how much time are you thinking would be appropriate? I would say just 30 minutes is. So only 15 people can talk. Uh, if they, so we can, you know, as we had initially discussed internally that we can limit the time for general comments mm -hmm. and the comments on the agenda items that we divide that time, the 30 minutes for general comments and 30 minutes for items on the current business and agenda, which are to be discussed by the board members. And if anybody else has any comments, they can use that time. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we should have a guidance, but I think we're going to have to be flexible because I think there are going to be times when there's a lot of public comment and we need to recognize that, that there might be a lot of issues. If you fix yourself too tight, I, I think it, it may work against you. I, I, I don't mean to um, contradict Amelia, but I do believe that the RCW does allow for us to limit it to items that are on the agenda for a vote. The public comment RCW reads, except in an emergency situation, the governing body of a public agency shall provide an opportunity at or before every regular meeting at which final action is taken for public comment. The public comment, and it goes on to talk about how you provide that public comment, the third item in this says nothing in this section prevents a governing body from allowing public comment on items not on the meeting agenda, which yeah. leads me to believe that it could be limited to those uh, to items that are only those that are on the current agenda. It's true. You can limit you can either limit it to agenda only or have it open. You can't limit it to like one topic or anything like that. But I'm just yeah. I, I was just going to say that both the Vancouver City Council meetings and the Clark County Council meetings are limited to comment to uh, items on the agenda and uh, members of the public have to uh, identify which agenda item they're going to speak about ahead of ahead of time. I think they actually offer two public comment periods, one for the items on the agenda and one for items not on the agenda, which I think is what Vikram was stating. Yeah, I wouldn't want to cut out open comment for sure. No, we don't want to cut out. 
we want to give them an opportunity to be heard as we have seen for our last many meetings it's more just political and ideological debates that people are having mm -hmm. nothing to do with the library at all right so if we are supporting that kind of you know actions that's fine you know every board member has their own views on you know what should be supported and what not but in interest of you know conserving everybody's time if we come to the meeting for the purpose of the meeting that's more helpful than you know just general hearing everybody's debate and ideological things but if we have 30 minutes for agenda and 30 minutes for open that's still an hour that's fine people can you know comment if they have any issues with the ongoing you know agenda items they can definitely talk we are here to listen to them but we don't want to listen to general ideological and religious debates i think i think that's our job sort of but i will we, i take disagree it. with that because I, the you know the rcw which is the guiding document and uh, we heard it from the ag who also recommended a you know similar kind of mm -hmm. you know half and half to limit general items yeah. general open comments so i'm willing and... to consider the split 30 30 but i'm not willing to only do agenda and i do think it's our job to hear their comments so whether should, they're open i, or I not. would say that we should hear from all the board members what their views are on mm -hmm. you know definitely we can hear from the board yeah. members but i'm not as the chair i'm not going to cut out open comment uh, chair's uh, responsibility is to facilitate the meeting mm -hmm. but not dictate what goes into the meetings right? i do believe it's my job to outline public comment parameters maybe somebody can help me maybe i'm wrong i mean it's it's per our guidelines and yeah. and um, the guidelines say yeah that the yeah. the chair sets the rules um we did get a legal opinion about this because um, Jane Jane is delightfully here, so I'm going to Jane and say, "Oh, here we go again." Um, but we did get a legal opinion at that time because Jane did believe we had the right to limit the comments to just items on the agenda, and the legal opinion came back to us that yeah. while it might, you know, appear that way, it would be foolhardy for us to do so because um, if we stand for a right to free speech um, and the First Amendment as an institution. Um, it, it's very, it's a very slippery slope if we start denying people the opportunity to speak. And so, you know, I think a compromise where it's, it's what most governmental bodies do to provide a time for each is, is a good one. Um, they very, um, you know, pointedly leave those more general comments for the end of the meeting rather mm -hmm. than the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. And so. I think that would be a good Thing. When we heard from the attorney, assistant attorney, attorney general, that's what they did. Um, yeah. Anyone else have discussion on this? Your mic's not on. Sorry. Sorry. Agreeing with Amelia <laughs> before the the meeting begins is would be on the agenda, and then anything after would be comments that are more general. And would give people an opportunity to address those back in your workplace and bring them to the next meeting if they're sophisticated enough issues. We've done it both ways. Um, and um, it makes for a very long evening for everyone when we wait for public comments till the end. Um, I don't feel like it was successful for us in terms of um, changing any hearts and minds because we exposed them to lots of good information about how wonderful our libraries were by making them sit through the entire meeting. Um, you know, yeah, it's... Am I on, can you bundle them at the beginning? Say the first 30 will be agenda, mm -hmm. like you can do it back to back? I, absolutely. I, you know, it's that asking people to stay through a lengthy meeting can be yeah, we because we don't see anybody around here who was there Everybody for the comments. Is. So we can give them the first 30 minutes, let them talk about all their, you know, talk their mind out on all the issues that they have. And then the next 30 minutes, we can just conduct our business. Or if you want to split 30 just for the public comments at the start of the meeting and keep the remaining later for our, you know, general business, then that's fine too. 
as long as we limit what what's done with the time and it's used efficiently. I'd also like to point out um, potential logistical difficulties if we limit the public comment even more than we already have. Um, we would, we would, I would just want to have some clarity around when we start to accept public comment. Is it first come, first serve? Are we, um, you know, where do virtual comments fall into that? We've been prioritizing them, but we've been fortunate enough that once we limited the hour comment period, um, we haven't had, and we've mostly been able to um, hear from everyone who wishes to speak within that hour. And I doubt we would do that if we limit to 30 minutes. So we, as the staff who, um, who do the logistics for taking those comments would need some guidance around how we prioritize um, being mindful of the fact that folks aren't just doing virtual comment because they're, um, uh, you know, uh, not as committed to the cause, but also for reasons like childcare, disability, they may be living in Goldendale and want to make public comment and they have every right to do so as well. So we would just need some guidance from the board about how to handle that to ensure that we were being as fair and equitable in the way that we um, took those requests and um, in what in which order. I, I just wanted to point out too, because um, I take a lot of notes that our last three meetings, the public comment has ended um, either 37 minutes, 42 minutes or 46 minutes. Um, there's been plenty of time um, and we've finished under an hour um, in the last three meetings. So I, I think uh, that's working well. Even if we do change it, we would have to wait and announce it next meeting and then, okay. So we have time to discuss this further. Okay. Any other discussion on this? Questions? We are still in meeting. If we want to you know, publish that, we can as part of this meeting, or if you want to take time to mm. discuss further, to uh, in the next meeting, that's fine too. To change the public comment period? Yes. Oh, I'm not willing to do that this meeting. Okay. I think that would be disrespectful to the public too. We are still in notice. meeting. I'm not willing to do that this meeting. Okay. Other questions or comments? So are we going to entertain shortening the time? Is that... Um, I, <laughs> I'm saying I, someone please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that I get to make that decision and I'm willing to consider splitting to 30, 30, taking into account all the logistics that Mary's brought up. Um, I'm not promising. I'm going to come back and say, yes, we're going to split it. I'm going to think about it. Um, I don't want to decide right now without taking all the different perspectives into consideration. And, and just for a point of clarification on the chair, this being the chair's uh, prerogative is, is the facilitator of the meeting. They are the one that then gets to set the guidelines for those public comments. Other discussion or questions? Okay, we will move on then to uh, finance committee. Wow, we got really off topic there. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to finance committee, the 2023 reserve plan review. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring this to the board's attention. Um, we spoke about it in the finance committee this month. So our um, revenues in 2022 exceeded our expenditures by $1,267,858 of unanticipated revenue, um, which meant that we did not need to expend any reserve funds uh, for the things we had allocated money for last year. Um, the chart that is on um, the staff report, um, oh, oh good, you put it up there. It's very small, so I apologize for the size. Um, but in this, you can see what we budgeted. We allocated some additional funds, you may recall in October um, that were uh, due from some excess revenue from 2021 that then got allocated um, into our reserves. 
um, than that final uh, amount that was allocated, what we expended in 2022, so what we had budgeted for to spend in those areas, what the end balance would have been if we had spent that money, um, and then um, what our current balance is. So we currently have $12 million, $40 and 400, uh, sorry, $40,420 in our reserves. I'm always paranoid when we construct things because you never know what you're going to find in the ground or uh, <laughs> other issues. And so I was feeling very comfortable with as many construction projects as this board's doing right now that we had some reserve as backup just in case. And so far, things have been going really smoothly. Knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I'm very cautious that with the number of construction projects you're doing, that we, we should probably assume that maybe something may go awry on one of them and that some of that money will have to be used to uh, deal with that. I think that's what we did last year is we allocated some to the Washougal and some to the woodland construction just because of that. And whether we can do that again this year, I think would be a wise decision, but not right yet, a little Correct. later in the yeah. year. This is more for information for you at this point. Um, you know, we're, we will be bidding the um, woodland job in um, June and July. So we'll have a better sense of the budget um, where we land with that once we get those bids. Um, but mainly, I'm just trying to let you know this is you know this is our financial position in terms of our reserves. Um, they're assigned reserves, which means they can be moved around. They're not dedicated reserves, so that does give you some flexibility. And as a former city administrator, I know that building near or on old roads often have their interesting surprises. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to find forgiveness for minors with Lynn. Hello again, I'm Lynn Caldwell. And uh, last month I spoke to you all about reestablishing our relationship with Unique Library Services in efforts to get back our long overdue library books. And as part of the board discussion that day, Olga said something about um, she wishes we could do more for minors. And so I'm bringing you today uh, an idea for something we could do to help minors who turn 18. I, I wrote a staff report, and I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but what I'm suggesting is that minors don't have full control of their lives, they're minors. And that once they turn 18, uh, I would like to be able to forgive their charges if they have lost library books. Um, my idea would be I would, um, I wouldn't personally do it, but <laughs> excuse me, I would have someone do it. Um, we would forgive their charges and then switch them from a full access card to a limited card, which allows only three checkouts until they come in and take responsibility as a new adult and show their ID again, re reconfirm their address and sign their account themselves. Yes. When I read that, I was um, kind of going, mm -hmm. I would like more time to make them, let them make a mistake after they become an, you know, if, if you forgive that, hey, if this pattern's continuing, he ain't going to forgive you. Mm -hmm. And give them like a three month temporary um, that, yeah. But uh, Marianne, what if the bills were incurred when they were like five years old and they haven't been in the library in 13 years? Would you assume that they're like, they need a- Maybe we give our car. Um, person some wiggle room on that. You know, I, I think probably, most of the cases I'm speaking of, they're not using their account because they owe too much. Like they, if you owe more than $25, you can't use your account. I mean, that's one hardback adult book, you know? Okay. So it's not, it, it could be more than that, but it, it may be one or two items. And, you know, if you're 12, you're adult, if you can't drive, I mean, we see fewer and fewer, I think, people just walking, children walking the neighborhoods and going to libraries on their own. Usually their adult is with them or if they're a driving age or, or something, they, they can go on their own. But really their adult is the responsible person in the household. 
And Marianne, as a point of clarification, after that one-time forgiveness, they would be subject to all of the same fees. So if they damaged a book or lost a book moving forward, after that one-time forgiveness, they would be responsible as adults okay. to to um, to pay those um, fees and um, and to take responsibility for that. Yeah, it's not a lifetime pass. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just you turn eighteen, we'll clear your account um, and let you have a fresh start. I thought your report was really well put together and I like the idea a lot. Thank you. Other questions or comment on this? And so this was just informational. We could move it to the next meeting. Is that exactly? We'd bring a resolution back to you to make this change. Other questions? Um, I, I think it didn't make it into your report, um, but I did look up the statistic for how many teens or children in Washington live in poverty, and it's about 47%. So when you think of 14% of our accounts versus the number of kids living in poverty, um, while it's, you know, far less than that number, it's still a significant number of kids that are, you know, not able to use the library. So I think it's, it has its value. I'm not seeing any other discussion. Um, so we can move on to the personnel committee update. Well, in Oga's absence, I will say that we are reviewing the recruiters and the different companies that do the searching for um, our replacement. Um, we have a personnel committee meeting coming up next week with Lee to get together with her and uh, look at more companies and make a decision on that. And we're not there yet. And that's about it. Thank you. Any questions for her? Okay. Oh, did you have one? Go ahead. Not a question, just as a statement. Um, obviously, the audience has mostly left, so... <laughs> Um, but it's been such a privilege um, serving in this role, and I'm um, excited about uh, what the future holds for FBRL. I feel very optimistic about it, um, but I also realize this is a long, hard process to find a new director, and I, I certainly wish the district well. Um, I don't think it's been mentioned, but Mary Obler, our deputy director, has also turned in her resignation. She'll be leaving us to join the San Mateo County Library System in um, California as their new deputy director. And um, so I also wish her well. Well, I don't know about this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we wish her well, yes. <laughs> I'll turn it over to board comments. Does anyone have a comment they wanted to make? I wanted to thank Mary for her time with us. And this is her last board meeting. I believe May 5th is your last day, correct? I really appreciate all the work and help that you have done for me and for other board members. Thank you so much. What is the plan for um, organizing public comment at our next board meeting? Do we have Do we have a transition plan? We do, and we will be uh, sorting that out. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but tonight might have been my smoothest evening. I only missed one of the timers um and it was the last person so um but yes we we will have a plan moving forward and um and i feel like uh we have we've figured out the hybrid meeting and luckily um that person doesn't have to come in and recreate the wheel so um i will be leaning heavily on our administrative team to assist with um continuing to to keep public comment uh, moving forward as well as our executive assistant um, and I will just um, share that I also have um, really wor enjoyed working with the board um, and of course learning from Amelia and serving the um, Southwest Washington community here. Um, it is a bittersweet departure and um, I, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Tell your husband you shouldn't have gotten a job for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to thank Zoe for the hosting us tonight. Thank you. And I love your seed library. That's so unique. Yeah, that's really neat. Any other comment or from the board? Okay. Could I get a motion to adjourn? Oh, wait, wait, wait. The next meeting is Monday, May 15th, hybrid at Stevenson Community Library.
Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second. All right, this meeting's adjourned. I feel like I killed a tree. <laughs> <laughs>